Hey there, Knicks fans. How you doing? It is your boy, John of the Macri, with you for another episode of the Knicks Film School Podcast. Coming at you with a special surprise guest filling in for Jeremy Cohen, who uh, work obligations this weekend, unfortunately, got the better of him. Yes, he does things other than crunch numbers here at Knicks Film School. Filling in admirably. Um, and I know he's filling in admirably because he got up uh, on what was it this this morning? Yeah, or last night? And when did you? He rewatched a game that he knew was going to include a great deal of pain. And who am I talking about? None other, of course, than Benji Ritholtz. Hello, Benji. Hello, John. Uh, it's good to be here. Although I will say, replacing Jeremy is the size of the shoes are overwhelming. Is overwhelming. It's Jeremy's big feet. <laughs> big feet. Listen, the Jeremy John Pod is it's a staple. It's a staple in the lives of Nick fans. So mm-hmm. it is is humbling to be here. I'll do my best to fill in for my redheaded recessive brother. And would you say it's more goes? or or less of a staple than uh the combination of Julius Randall and winning basketball? Uh, a sta- <laughs> definition a staple is something that you and Jeremy have been by far more consistent than Julius Randle in winning basketball games. It would be yeah. as if you and Jeremy every other year, like dr- you know, like got drunk before the pod <laughs> and tried to do your podcast every other like that. That would be the equivalent of the Julius Randle winning basketball games equation. Uh, what an equation it is, and we will. <laughs> We will talk about the running start uh, and we will talk about it. So, um, yeah, let's let's try to keep it together, at least for a bit. So uh, start things off as we always do. We can review uh, the Knicks played three games this week. Uh, they won one of those basketball games and they came dangerously close to winning. I, you could say they came dangerously close to winning all three of those basketball games. Unfortunately, they only got that one one. In the in the win column, uh, losing uh, subsequent games to the Cavs at home and then to the Bucks in Milwaukee. Uh, it is their second consecutive one and two week to open the season. Uh, we're going to get into the weeds on this in a little bit, but I'll uh, do as I would do with Jeremy by just throwing it to you and just saying, uh, Benji, what are your impressions from this week? I wish there was a lot more to talk about. Uh, and I hope we'll, we'll find what to talk about. But look, I mean, the team is built around two guys who soak up a lot of the usage. And a third. I should say really three, but two and a half. The half is not here. He's been injured for two of these three games, right? Yep. And one of the two has been a disaster this season so far. Um, they can't win a lot of games with this version of Julius Randle. They just can't. In fact, they traded the guy who theoretically, quote, in quotes, could, could replace him. Like, they're going to need Julius Randle. He's the only power forward on the roster. And if he continues to perform like this, they're going to keep going one and two on three game series. <laughs> like, I don't know. I don't know how much more analysis there is to it. There, there's obviously what to talk about individual players, things that we've seen. There's been growth um, defensively, things that, like the, the, the funny thing about it so far is there are a lot of things to be very encouraged about. In terms yeah. of how this team is playing, the defense has been really stout. Um, I want to get back to that in a second. We've but seen growth, but like end of the day, big takeaway this week and last week, they need Julius Randle to play like Julius Randle needs to play. Like that's pretty much where where the line is, right? I I don't want to make this entire episode about Randle, even though it certainly could be. And yeah. Uh, because of what you just said, um, it's like, you know, some organizations have one sun that all the planets orbit around the Knicks. You know, you can, maybe you could argue that, that Jalen Brunson's a little little brighter, a little bigger, um, and, uh, you know, a little bit more gravitational pull in the old orbit there. But like, it, I almost wonder, and I'll, I'll ask you, because to me, I it, I almost want to say that even though Brunson is, you know, the better player, even though Brunson is the guy that kind of turned their franchise into like elevated their franchise to a different level, you know, the closer, like all those things. I almost feel like it's more detrimental 
when Julius is off because Brunson can be off and you don't feel and not that he's been off that much to be clear. I mean, like we could probably count the number of games on two hands where Brunson like over over the whole time he's been here, like really has not looked like himself. I feel like you could it's it's tougher. But it you you don't feel like he is an anchor taking down the ship, whereas with Julius and and like I my so my question to you is like is what I am saying accurate? And two, if it is accurate this season at least, do you think it's just be, he's because he's bad or because he is so unfathomably bad? And you we, if you want to share the number that you were joking about right before we went live, I feel <laughs> free to do it. Like you see where I'm I'm getting at here. Yeah, well, I think his place on the roster is unique because, again, he's the only power forward on the roster. Um, Brunson, when he is off a bit, like his production can be replaced to some extent by the Quickleys and by DiVincenzo's and by RJ. Sure. Like Randall does... He's just in a different role on the roster that nobody else can can replicate. It's the guys he's guarding bigs. He's guarding, you know, big wings. He's he's extremely important on the boards. And he's involved in almost like if he's on the floor, Randall, he's almost if you know, if you kind of see how the Knicks play, Randall is almost never just spaced in the corner. Almost never. He spends very little time in the corner. Maybe he just spend more time in the corner, but that's a separate discussion. No, I don't mean that like facetiously. No, I mean, I, I, I mean, know, I know. They, they, he, he, he is such a, he's almost like a, a magnet of usage. He's always in the play. He's setting a screen. He's on top of the key. He's a one pass away at most. So everything kind of, even when Brunson has the ball, Randall's always in the picture. He does have kind of a unique place in the system in the roster that I think does when he looks like this drags down what the entire team is doing offensively in a way that Brunson doesn't also just in terms of like Brunson's at a place where he's always going to earn teams respect. Yeah. That's, that's kind of what I was getting at. He's always going to be someone who the defense is going to really worry about Randall at times when he's playing like this teams play with him. Teams play with it. They bait him and they, and they make him do things that make him uncomfortable. And Look, the stats speak for themselves. Like, I mean, there's a, there's a there's a blue zero on cleaning the glass next to effective field goal percentage. A zero, zero. It should be a different color. It the should zero. be red. It should be very bright red. <laughs> it should be very bright red. Um. So yeah, it's it's it is different. It is different. What what his poor play does. We saw it two years ago too. It it, it he's he's uniquely positioned on the roster and it causes unique results. Let's say. It does. And it, it, like what you just said about like, if Randall keeps playing like this, they're going to have more one in two weeks. I, I was thinking about this today and I, I don't want to go too, too much on a tangent. And I'll, I promise I'll bring this back to the Knicks. And it, it is early to say, I'm, I shouldn't say what I'm about to say, but I'm just being honest with everybody. Like, this is what goes through my mind. I'm looking at the East and I'm like, okay, there's, you know, the Washington's bad and Detroit looks like at the end of the day, it's going to be bad, even though they've been pretty spunky. And like, I know you love your Charlotte over there. As, <laughs> as last I checked, they were beating Dallas um, in Dallas. But I, I, I still until I see a little bit more, I'm going to skew on the side of like the, the Hornets are probably not topping 35 wins. Maybe we'll be wrong about that. We'll see. Um, and again, maybe overly disrespectful. Maybe I just don't don't think great about teams that have like all sorts of team meetings in the first week of the season. I kind of think the bulls are reaching an expiration point as well. Um, and they might not again, not that they don't have the talent to pull out of it. I just, I don't have a lot of faith in them. That leaves 11 teams. And in that 11 teams, there are teams like your Orlando magics and your Indiana Pacers um, and your Toronto Raptors who had a spectacular win. I, I watched most of that game earlier today, coming back on San Antonio. They're down 22 in that game came all the yep. way back convincingly. Scotty Barnes, Ooh. Um, you know, when you could go up and down the, I, Brooklyn is another team. I mean, like have, has looked mighty competent. Uh, it's, it's, like, it's a tough game. It's always going to be a tough game against Brooklyn. They're feisty. Yeah. They're, they're switchable. They're versatile. Yeah. yeah. So like I was thinking to myself, like, okay, like, look, Randall's not going to be this bad all year. He, he's going to be better. But if Randall is not Randall of last year and Randall is something 
closer to the Randall of two years ago, or just he is the Randall of two years ago or the Randall of four years ago to go with the every other year thing. Like I was thinking to myself, would I really bet my life that like the Knicks are going to finish with a better record than those all of like individually? Like, am I sure the Knicks are going to finish with a better record than Orlando or Indiana or Brooklyn? And you could, and pretty soon you could do that exercise and you could get to 10 teams now, do I think there are going to be 10 teams that f- finish ahead of the Knicks? No. But the fact that I even have to have this back and forth with myself, one, it's deranged. Um, and two, <laughs> and two, it speaks to the, the reality of what, to me, of, of what you just said, which is that if Randall is not right because of his impact on this team, like, I wonder if this turns from a season in which the Knicks are having notions about getting a home field advantage into a season in which shit, we're like sweating out play-in seating coming down the stretch in March. It, it, please tell me I am overreacting. I will not be mad if you do, but that's where my head is at after seeing the level of play that we've seen from Randall thus far. No, I don't think like if this was a player that has been consistent throughout his career, we'd all just say like, okay, this is a ridiculously Six, awful start. Yeah, but be. I think I don't think that's disingenuous to not like and I said after like the third game I was like uh, my my concern level is rising that was what I said and people like jumped on me about that I was like look this is someone who derailed the season 2 years ago who has not put together it, it's been one of the strangest careers that I can remember oh it's 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 just an odd odd career full of weird twists and turns and you just don't know where it's going to go next so yeah I mean like it's not it, not overreacting. This is like a historically bad start. It's not just like a bad start. Yeah. Um. So like, I think it's very fair to be extremely worried, and at the same time, I think it's reasonable to think he's going to bounce back to some extent. Yeah. Um. But there's the potential with him that it spirals out of control, and that's that's the huge concern. And where do the Knicks? Where can the Knicks go if that happens? Like, I, I think. I worry with this coach and with that relationship and like what exactly is there a pivot at some point? And when do you make that pivot? If you do it all speak more on that for a second, then I'm going to, I promise we're going to move on from Randall because there is other, <laughs> there is other important stuff to talk about. We yes. Have stats that are, that I think are encouraging uh, mm-hmm. in terms of like what, what is coming and, and how things will improve. But like to me, listening to Tibbs after the Bucks game, it seems like he's clearly frustrated with Randall. I I know he didn't call Randall out by name, but like it's hard. Like Tibbs, he's it, it, not very good about beating around the bush. When he wants you to know what he's talking about, he's going to say it in such a way that you know. Like he's he's frustrated with Randall. So like, but at the same time, you're obviously right because we've seen him stick with Randall. He's he's given enough rope, Randall enough rope to nearly hang himself because he almost got himself fired two years ago. So mm-hmm. like I like where where can this go if it Again, I hope it doesn't continue. I don't think it's going to continue. But like you just you just brought up the tips part of it. So like what wh- what do you think of that? Yeah. When you had Obi Toppin, he wouldn't really make that pivot. Um you no. don't have him now. Is Tibbs going to like let you know, god forbid this continues for 15 20 games. Will will sure. Tibbs start to like play Randall 25 minutes? Do you see a world where that happens? And like plays a lot of hard at four and RJ at four and goes small. Like, and on one hand, I understand it to some extent because in Tibbs' mind, it's like if I'm going anywhere, if I'm going anywhere, I need Julius Randle to figure it out. So instead of like if I overreact and I let's say bench him, we're just okay. So like, what's the ceiling of this team then if Julius Randle isn't very good? That's and like I don't. So so it is. There, there's there's nuance to it. Like I, I, even if it's not as simple as like. You earn your playing time and Julius isn't earning it. Um, at the same time, you're looking at a big picture of what you want this team to be. And if Julius needs to be, a big, Julius needs to be a big part of that. There's no question. At the same time, you'd hope that there is some pivot in there, either to send the message, to try to find a, a, an avenue to productive play without him uh, for the longer haul. Um, 
who like, and, and we're not even talking about maybe the front office getting involved in this Randall issue if it if it persists. But well, that's I want to come way back to that, down the but, line. Yeah, yeah, that's way down the line. But you know, that's the kind of the thing is like. I think Tibbs. I think Tibbs feels like he needs this guy, so he's going to continue to play him no matter what. Basically, that's what we've seen. The worry is, does there ever come a time where he's like, "I need this pivot to be made"? I don't know if I don't. I don't think there is. Like, I think he's just going to ride this out. I was I was texting with someone earlier today, and they basically were like, "Why? Why is this guy still here? Why? Like, why is the front office not made a move before?" And my thinking is that they see Julius as kind of exactly what you just said, which is he raises their ceiling, he lowers their floor and their bet has been twofold. One, we are going to go for the ceiling and trust that because of our infrastructure, because of Tibbs in part, that we will weather the floor parts and that it is worth it for us to go for the ceiling that Julius Randall provides. More importantly than all of this, of course, is the fact that I don't think they've ever had an opportunity where they're like, man, we really can't pass up this opportunity to, to, to get this thing yeah. for Julius Randall or these things for Julius Randall because the rest of the league knows that Knicks fans are having these fucking conversations because they all watch all the same fucking games that we do. So it's not like I don't I don't think I could be wrong. Obviously, I don't know this for a fact, but I would imagine no one has ever tried to beat their doors down with an offer where it's like, man, we we, we can't turn this down. You know, this is too good. But that's the front office. Tibbs is a bit of a different story because in theory, famous last words, in theory, he could go through a stretch where he does play Julius or any other player for that matter, 25 minutes a game. And then as the ship writes, you know, goes goes back. But that's where I get back to like, is it because he's just... He he's worried about losing him, or is it just because he's a he's a stubborn? I, I feel always terrible when I say he's stubborn, even though he's very stubborn. But like, it's not just stubbornness; it's like he knows the formula. Like he mm-hmm. knows the formula when Randall goes. Is, like, I don't have to tell you. You you know. You you see what I'm getting at? Yeah, no, and I think it's all those things. I think it's complex. Like I think he's probably worried he would lose him. I think big picture he feels like if he, if he doesn't figure it out we're not going anywhere anyway so i might as sure. well try to get him to figure it out i think that's part of it i think there's a complicated relationship there i, I think if you, you know and i think no I, and i think tibbs was tibbs was out of the league and he gets this job and a big reason that he's had any success here is because julius randall yeah and i think that matters and from from julius's perspective he was not a lot of that league, but what was where was he go? Where was that career going? Where was this career going before Tibbs got here? He had a horrible first year in New York. Tibbs shows up. He makes an All NBA team. The chances of him making an All NBA team in his career before Tibbs showed up were probably under five percent. I think that's accurate. So there's a we brought each other's success, and both of us were in, in tough times in our careers, respective careers, and we brought each, we brought each other. Tremendous success. And I think that complicates things in terms of both of them, in terms of how they feel about each other and 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 whether you can just turn your back on that, I think is complex. So I think all of that plays in. There's a human element to coaching always that doesn't get talked about enough. And what that means, I think just complicates the the decision making. And I think we've seen that. We've seen that bear out. Um Let's move away from, as I say, let's move away from Randall and move to this uh, segment of the pod, which uh, Andrew Claudio has lovingly called pick your favorite stupid stat. Uh, Sure enough, the first stupid stat is Julius Randall related. So we'll just we'll read this and then we can move on. Julius Randall is currently shooting 27 percent from the field, 22 and a half percent from three and um, 60 a little under 62 percent from the line He's a 32 effective field goal percentage. Andrew didn't even include my favorite stat, which is that Julius <laughs> Julius Randall is shooting seventeen uh, percent around the rim in the restricted area this season. Yeah, that's been that's been a big issue. That's been a big issue. I think they have disproportionately played really good rim protecting teams. Um, but man, yeah, cleaning the glass just actually burst into flames. Uh, it is currently on fire. Uh, yeah, it's been it's been. 
So uh, that's stupid set number one. Stupid set number two. Uh, the Knicks are second in the NBA in open three point field goal attempts, meaning they get the second most open threes um, behind only the Warriors. Um, however, they are 30th in hitting those <laughs> open threes at 25%. Um, this to me is the stat, and it's going to relate to the next one uh, that is just like. It, there's not much reading into this. Teams are like, hey, if you're going to beat us, you're going to beat us from three and we're going to um, and we're going to sag off you guys and they're just not hitting the shots. And I, I it's like everybody is not to blame. There are t- players on this team who are hitting their threes. Uh, but yeah, this is what it is. Yeah, I, look, I think teams are always pretty happy to let Julius and Josh Hart fire away. Um, and those still- guys... And those guys have been horrendous from three so far. Um, and by the way, they're, they're pretty happy to let RJ Barrett fire away too. And RJ has been very good. And again, yep. Yep. he's been missing. And I think it's really hurt this team, especially with Randall struggling, like to be able to just kind of like reallocate some of that usage to a, to a surging RJ Barrett would be really nice right now. And they can't um, do it. Yeah, absolutely. And I, well, we're, well, we're on the topic. I will just say that, uh, do speaking of, our friends at cleaning the glass. Um, so yeah, you mentioned Julius Randall is shooting 22% from three. Um, and Josh Hart is shooting a, a robust 25% from three on 20 attempts. So Josh Hart's putting up almost four attempts a game from deep, which is, we probably would have signed for that, right? Good, good, yeah. good, good. Yeah. Yeah. He's got to keep yeah. shooting him. No question. Yeah. It, it, they're just not going in. Um, By the way, Genzo, and, and, but, sorry. Yeah. I, I, I think they're, I think, with Hart, there's probably an expected regression after what he did with the Knicks second Absolutely. half of the year. He shot the lights out, and he's never been a very good shooter. So I think this is kind of like evening out a bit, and hopefully it just kind of stabilizes to whatever, 34 35%, which, will, which was passable for him and fine, and will do. As long as he gets enough up, I think that's fine, and they can live with that. 25, they can't really live with. 35, they can live with. 34, they can live with, you know? Yeah, and we should say the reason that Randall – the 22% has been hurting him so much is he, he's, he's put up 43s this year. So, you know, the, the volume is almost where it was last year. Not quite. And then uh, I was about to mention DiVincenzo nine to 27. He's 33%. Like for a guy playing 20 minutes a game, he's putting up almost, um, uh, almost five attempts a game. Like he's, he's, he's hoisting them up. They're just, they're not going down right now. Everybody else. Has like quickly is at thirty three percent. I should throw him in there too. Quickly. Yeah, I, yeah. Look, quick. We've said it. I, like, make shots. He's, I, he did a lot again towards the end of the year. He, he really turned it on in terms. Of, but like every year, we have these stretches where quick where, is just not shooting the ball quite well enough. He's playing great. I've really liked his season so far. He's one of the best best players in the league. Does a lot of things great. It would be really nice if he became a consistent 37, 38% three point shooter, and it just hasn't really happened. Um. So I'm waiting for that. That would be nice. Yeah. And like you look at the lineup data. And so the bench units stink again on, in terms of offense. Um, and it's not surprising because I just read off three names that are predominantly playing with the bench. Yeah. Vincenzo Hart and quickly. And then the starting unit with Hart has been uh, poo poo offensively because again, it's two of the three or two of the, the guys out there. And then they're always playing with a, a regular five. So that's... Um, those are the lovely three point numbers. Okay, this one I added before. Uh, the Knicks are last by a country mile in field goal percentage at the rim. Uh, cleaning the glass has them at shooting fifty percent at the rim. The next worst team at the rim going into tonight's games. We're recording this on Sunday. Was shooting over fifty eight percent at the rim, and then you have the Knicks at fifty percent. I. This strikes me as even like putting aside, okay, teams are like packing the paint and the, the Knicks are again always playing a, a big that stays mostly in the paint and the whole thing. And like Julius is trying to attack and maybe situations where it's not wise to attack. Like this seems to me like there's some bad luck in here and it's, it's, it's going to get better. Please, please tell me that that's true. I think it's true. You know, I think they have played, you know, you look at the, it's again, it is always, any stat you read, tremendously small sample size. So Six like, games, yes. A lot to like, a lot of noise. I think they've played. Think about the rim protection. Porzingis, Mobley twice, Lopez. and 
Lopez, who was a monster, and awesome. I should say Lopez slash Giannis, which are always going to be one of the best for protecting teams in the league. Um, you know, and Capella, Capella no bad. slouch. Yeah. And New Orleans, I threw that game out the window. That was just a disgraceful game. But, you know, so they've played really, really good. Some of the best rim protecting teams in the league. That probably has a lot to do with it. Um, I think when Josh Hart starts, the, 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 the lane is just so clogged. There is just no spacing. So trying to get attempts at the rim is not going to be easy. I think one of the ways that they could help fix this is getting their centers some shot attempts. Um, Mitch barely shoots right now. He's not getting a lot of lobs, if any. No. And that hurts when RJ's out because he's probably the best on the team at getting him some some lobs. Like Mitch shoots when he gets touches, he shoots like seventy five percent at the rim, whatever. So he's off. He's bad this year, but I think that that, that to me is the yeah classic but, small sample size because yeah, he's like yeah he's it, it, he's like uh, if he tips up a ball towards the basket. That will get countered as a shot attempt. Like there exactly. were three of those against the Bucks out of his four shot attempts that he missed all of them. Exactly. So I think that is it's incumbent on on Brunson especially because he's really not good at, at finding Mitch when even when I think he's got some 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 windows. It's hard when you're six feet tall, but like there are some windows up there to just throw the ball up to him, try to get some easy lobs that way. Um, but yeah, I mean a lot of this comes also down to just again Julius Randall's got to make some layups, the shots. Steven Chenzo's been a disaster at the rim. I was about to say. <laughs> I, I, talk about layup. coming as advertised. I knew he was shaky at the rim. Oh, man. His little, little, little over-the-shoulder flip shot that never goes in. Um, yeah. yeah that's, a, that's been a problem. So, yeah. Look, I think this will even out as they play some, some less rim-protecting inclined basketball teams. Uh, and some guys get just kind of up to speed, and hopefully they start to find Mitch and Hartenstein a bit on these roles so that they can get some easy dunks and layups. That would be nice. Yeah, um, it would. And then we don't have to belabor this point because you just mentioned how the, the Hart starting five uh, is, has been very bad. 101 possessions, uh, minus 12.9 with an effective field goal percentage of 35. It's not what you want. I'd like to see them pivot. Start quick. Just start quick. I... I again, I was an idiot for doing it because it didn't come true. But I, I was like, oh, okay, they'll probably start quick. If when I heard that RJ was out and it was hard, and I was like, hmm, okay, well, I, I mean, I got it, I understood it. I just, yeah, like there's that de- there's desperate for some spacing, man. They just need a little bit more. Like Brunson is is operating in these crazy tight windows of space, and the, what he does is so exceptional. Like what he did against Milwaukee, oh. um, man. It's just like, can we can we help a brother out? And Julius would benefit too with a little more space. He keeps saying, "I'm see- all I'm seeing is bodies in front of me." <laughs> okay, so like help him out a little bit with with yeah. with your personnel and try to get some spacing lineups in there. I think it would be helpful. Uh. Good, good transition. You just brought up Jalen Brunson. So time to give out our game ball. Game ball is given to a player, coach, or entity. Could it be the entity? Like in uh, Mission Impossible, Dead Reckoning Part 1? That's a Maybe Andrew could research that one. Yeah, maybe you, should bring, maybe you should bring Andrew up here because I don't know what you're talking about. There he is. <laughs> so in the movie Mission Impossible, Dead Reckoning, colon, Part 1. Part 1. Andy, uh-huh. I guess the, there's I guess there's multiple colons in that movie. Anyway, what is uh, it? Who's yeah. reckoning? Tom Cruise fights an AI. Of course. Like it's an entity. It's called the entity. And sure. it's like an algorithm that could voice change and it like takes them on different adventures, but only part one of an adventure. Mm-hmm. You want to know it's actually really funny, Benji? The last time I think you were on with John, you brought up the Fast and the Furious movie you saw. Yes. Yes, very similar to that movie. Please don't compare. Also, John, there's a, that movie, one of the great movie Pro franchises. Talk to the guy to that you, whose movie opinion shit. you hold the highest, and that's Oz. And what did he compare it to when I talked to him? I was like, "Is this Fast and Furious?" He's like, "Yeah, this is Fast Nine and a Half, or whatever it's called." Please, I'm, I'm saying, I'm giving you a person that whose opinion you hold very high. That's the exact. Well, I don't agree with him on this. One. Benji, when's the last Mission Impossible movie you've watched? I've never. I, remember? I, I'm not sure I've ever seen a Mission Impossible movie. Okay. That's unfortunate for you. They're actual secret that. agents rather than the My, mechanics in the Fast and Furious. <laughs> okay, but but are you comparing plot points? Like as in, I'm like, dead serious. There's literally them going through Italy too, which happens in. Okay, but fast like, and furious. no one ever knows or pays attention to a plot in a fast movie. I'm telling like the you, fact the, that you even know the, there is AI. There's 
There's no. Oh, plot. there's no AI in that movie. In this, in this movie, there's. Then what are you comparing? It's, what is happening here? The stunts that it's very much just like stunt, stunt, stunt. Oh yeah, there's an AI you have to get. There's also okay. MacGuffin with a key, okay. which is kind of weird. Right. Yeah. Oh wow. There's stunts in a MacGuffin. <laughs> Congratulations, you just named every action movie in. The Listen, I didn't love this movie. Cinema. Oppenheimer came out the following week, and I was like, oh look, character development. I thought Dead Rock was awesome. Okay, anyway, I did not. Oppenheimer has explosions. That. It's basically Mission Impossible. There you go. It's the same film. Um, we'll have an Oppenheimer discussion at another time. I'm, I'm curious what you think about that movie. Um, okay. Game ball candidates. Uh, Mitchell Robinson is wiping the floor with the league in offensive rebounds. Uh, I just checked earlier today. He's averaging six a game. Next best is uh, Jalen Duran at like 4.2 a game, and Duran's missed time. Uh, I think he's 11 in terms of total offensive rebounds. He's 11 ahead of Asar Thompson. Uh, also sixth in the entire league in rebounding total. So he's pulling down, uh, doing work on the defensive glass as well. Uh, Jalen Brunson, uh, 45 spot um, on Milwaukee, the highest uh, so far. For, I love how Andrew puts this highest ever in the history of the in season tournament ever. <laughs> Uh, RJ Barrett uh, nominated for a game ball for playing one game and missing two. Why? Because he shows his value. That's what game ball is all about. It's about value. And then um, last two are interesting. So this is Mike Vaccaro of the New York Post suggested Knicks pull a Trey Turner at MSG on Monday. Um, it, I am assuming this was had to do with the suggestion that the fans should be overtly cheering for Julius Randall, correct? He literally wrote an article that suggested they I, should chant Julius Randall. And what I wrote on the doc was your heart's in the right place, Mike. You're a candidate for game ball. Ain't going to happen. Not this fan base. Uh, <laughs> Tell me what you think. I'm like trying to think of a like a movie scene where that starts with a couple, like one couple is trying to do something nice for the other and like gets like like flowers or like a gift or whatever. And the scene ends with like the person like throwing the flowers down, like the garbage disposal or something because things have had gone so bad. Um, but I can't think of a scene. So mission, mission impossible. Dead reckoning. I'm sure. I'm sure it was somewhere in one of, in the franchise. There's better <laughs> enough films. Uh, and, <laughs> and then the last nominee, uh, shout out to the whole crew at, at Penn six. Uh, our watch party happened on Friday. We had a great time. Um, the staff, everybody that came, obviously. And uh, yeah, shout out to them. Okay. Uh, I won the week over Jeremy, which I know you are you have nothing to do with that. But sadly, you you have to watch me give out the first game ball. Me and Jeremy. Uh, yeah, Jeremy actually consults with me before his oh, picks. There it is. So I, I take some of the burden. Uh, hmm. I'll let you. Uh, well, I don't know who. I don't want to assume you're going to choose someone. Uh, I'll give it to Jalen Brunson. Um, I did a little little researching. Jalen Brunson is the ninth Nick um, to score 45 points in a, uh, at least two games in a Nick uniform, and uh, that's pretty cool. Um, you know, and it's a it's a pretty pretty nice list that he's joined. <laughs> Julius Randle is also on the list, but it's a, it's a it's a good list. It's a list filled with all stars and. Uh, um, so it was cool to see. It was thrilling. The three that he made was, I was for the, that was the only time all night where I'm like, Oh my God, we might actually win this game. And then, and then they didn't, but, uh, it wasn't Jalen Brunson's fault. I thought he was magnificent. Yeah. You know, you can, I've now watched Brunson enough and come to know his game enough where like, I can kind of, I know when it's coming. Like, so <laughs> When he faces a team where there are multiple targets he can go at, perimeter defenders that he can go at and feel good about that matchup, you just get a sense. So, like, Cleveland's always a good matchup for him. The Bucks now, with moving Holiday, and now you're really throwing Beasley and Lillard at him. Like, it, they just don't have a chance. And And the beauty of Brunson is, yeah, they have Giannis and Brooke on the back line, but, like, he doesn't get to the back line. It's He's, mid range yeah. floaters. Like the whole thing, what he does can draw in contact. So Atlanta is always a good matchup for the same reason. Like you can just kind of put Trey into action, and just wreck him. So like, yeah, he's magnificent. Uh, and I'm glad he, you know, we, we, I know we said on the post game after whatever game that was, we're like, I'm not, we're not worried about Jalen Brunson. No, uh, he's going to be fine. He's fine. 
clearly. Um, I, I'll, I'll go with Mitch. That's I, I wanted you to talk about Mitch. I think Mitch has been the best Nick. Um, I have been so impressed, so impressed with his discipline, with his multiple efforts. There's a confidence defensively, um, which is a funny, you know, there is defensive confidence, especially with a center who has to navigate multiple actions. He's just been so sure in terms of where he's going on the floor. What's the coverage? He was getting out on Dame, trapping, and then recovering back to the post up. He was, whenever there was a pick and roll with Giannis and that Julius was covering, Julius was blitzing it. There was Mitch on the back line. Giannis was meeting Mitch at the rim. And Mitch can, one of the few guys in the league who can kind of, I- kind of handle it i saw that clip in your throat i was like damn yeah like Giannis falling backwards because he's at like Giannis doesn't Giannis Giannis punishes people at the room that's what he's done his whole career and to see someone like overwhelm him a bit at the at like that he's unique in that sense mitch but it's it's the fact that he's there his positioning has been so good deflections hands out crouched position when he's in drop like all that stuff has just been more on point than we have ever seen from him in the first six games here. So that is, and you're, and now you're anchoring a top five defense here so far this year. And I think it's real. Like, I think they've been playing really, really solid defense and a, a lot, if not most of that is a credit to Mitchell Robinson. This is going to sound insane, uh, especially <laughs> since every person who brought this concept up before the season, I would respond by saying that is insane. Um, I think Jeremy, his preseason prediction with the lockdown guys was that Mitchell Robinson would get one singular one vote for defensive player of the year. And I was (laughs) like, that's, that's not happening. I, the biggest reason I'm rooting for them for the, and I, I, before, before we move on, I do want to just ask you about the defense. I I meant to do that before, but like the biggest reason I want this defensive rating to sustain for as long as possible. And I I don't know if it can, it can, I don't think it can at this level, but like somewhere in the range of this level is so maybe Mitch can finally make they could make a ma- real case for him. I don't know about defense player of the year, but like all, all defense. Teams. Yep. You know, because like you're looking at what's going on in Memphis, if they are kind of out of it, and I'm not saying they are, it's early, but like, you know, the Gobert, maybe people are kind of maybe he's fallen off enough that people are are willing to look at other yeah, although I think and they have the number, I think they have the number of one they one do. defense in the league, and <laughs> and he's still he's still an absolute. He's awesome. Right there. Yeah, he's. But awesome. you're right. There's fatigue. There's some fatigue with him. There, there's always voter fatigue, especially when guys won defense player of the year three times. Um, if the Bucks are going to struggle on defense like this, are they are they really going to give it? Uh, or, you know, go for a Brook Lopez at the center position <laughs> after an after an eight block performance? <laughs> very very yeah. likely. Uh, yeah, he was. There was a stretch where he blocked three straight shots. Yeah. The Knicks kept going at him. DiVincenzo tried to throw down a lefty tomahawk oh dunk on him. <laughs> was that not the most ridiculous thing you've ever seen in a game? Wild. That was like on par. So I'm like, watching that, and I, I I I often do this, right? I when something crazy happens, you you look at bench reactions. Chris Middleton, who's like a very very stoic kind of player, was sitting on the bench, and when he goes up for that and it gets blocked or hits the front rim, he just like. Bursts out this like really toothy wide smile. <laughs> like, like they were teammates like, for three years. Just deeply. R- that's right. Good point. Yeah. I, you know, honestly, I, I didn't even consider that. Right. He's probably thinking like this. Uh, yeah. This M ever. Like, Don't he was just like, was, he was so amused. Was he was yeah. so amused by the attempt. Um, I mean, that, that was bonkers. Yeah. Look, Brooks and Beast, though. Like, there, there is a lot of competition. Wemby's going to be, he might I, be, he, yeah. No question, all defense. So. Yeah, there are a lot of guys out there. Well, I hope he could, I hope he could get in on it. Okay. Me too. Um detention. Uh this is this is gonna be uh your first pick. <clears throat> Given to a player, coach, or entity. <laughs> Just read this for the first time. <laughs> This is what Andrew has written in the document. Give it to a player, coach, or entity named Julius Randle. Uh, our candidates, Julius Randle, bruh. Um, Josh Hart, for all the talk of Randle's struggles. Josh is shooting 39% from the field, 25% from three. Um, Tibbs, for uh, putting Josh Hart in the starting five, not only that, but also um, subbing in Hart for quickly down the stretch on Friday night. I didn't, I didn't get it at the time. Don't really get it in retrospect. Quick played 22 minutes in that game, and he was... He had a nice stretch in the late third, early fourth quarter there, um, at least offensively. Um, 
I'm sure defensively as well. I just noticed it more on offense. Uh, last two, the NBA officials for missing a moving screen that the last two minute report revealed. Um, that was from Friday night. And then uh, the NBA graphic design department, because these courts are the definition of not it. Again, that was per Andrew Claudio. Uh, you have the first pick here, uh, Benji. Who are you going with? <laughs> you can pick uh, someone else. It's not- yeah, I'm not going to take you. We talked about it enough. Uh, let's talk to Josh Hart. I'll, I'll put Josh Hart in detention. Sure. Um, it's not really for who I'd put in detention, but I'm going to, for the purposes of the exercise, I'll put him in detention. Um, I think coming into the season, I was kind of wondering where, where would this go with Hart? Because the role was very defined. He closed almost every game last year, second half of the year, when it, after he came over. And I had a feeling it wasn't going to quite go that way this year. And thankfully, I think. RJ being as good as he's been, he's been closing all the games, which I think as a Nick fan, you're probably like, that's a good development. If RJ is not being pulled out of close games late because he's been really good, that's overall excellent to not like, but what does that do to, to Josh Hart? And I think if Julius isn't shooting to add Josh Hart to a lineup where Julius isn't shooting plus Mitch is just really tough. It's just really, really tough. And then so now he's, his minutes are getting cut significantly and then it's harder for anybody to make an impact the less you're playing. The shooting, as we mentioned already, like it's regressed. I'm hoping it kind of evens out and levels out to a kind of a normal Josh Hart type of season. I think his defense has been very good. Very, very good. I don't want to... Uh, he's very consistent on that end. His rebounding has been excellent. I think it's, you know, again, all for all the worries of losing your backup power forward, like the team is... Tops and rebounding, both offensive and defensive this year. So, like, for, actually, been, they fall into third in offensive. They're first in defensive rebounding. Yeah. So, ha, yeah. I mean, rebounding has, suffice it to say, rebounding has not been the issue. No. Um, so, defense rebounding has been good, but like on the offensive end, he just kind of gets lost out there sometimes. What What is he doing if he's not, if he's spacing, but he's not a spacer? Um, and he's not finishing at the rim right now. So, yeah, we're going to need some more production, obviously, from the guy that we just signed to a pretty hefty extension. Um, He's going to have to find a role and start to excel at it again on the offensive end. So we're waiting for it. I, you know how certain players are like, I, I feel like they could it, could, it could be a chicken or the egg conversation about like, do they get the vibes going or are they someone that, that kind of starts rolling when the vibes get, positive like it was a perfect storm last year with Hart because things have been going well f- for the Knicks for a while and then he came in and he was excited to be here obviously because he probably knew the day he got traded that he was getting the contract extension um, and he's going with, with Brunson the whole thing and it was just the perfect storm and I don't know that Josh Hart could ever look as good or or, or make, make that like level of impact in the way he did when he first got here and if a team is like not going great, I not to say that he can't still make a positive impact. He obviously can because he's a hustle guy. And like you mentioned the defense, you mentioned the rebounding, but I don't know that he's the guy that's going to pull them out of it. You know, he needs to be play better because he needs to shoot better because it's like they, they need him to shoot better than he's shooting right now, but I finish at the rim, which he's usually very good at. Um, And he had one, he had one transition take. Where he kind of just plowed, I forget who it was, cutting back on defense, but one of his classic kind of left to right finishes, like that's Josh Hart. That's a Josh Hart. Oh, yes. So, yes, 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 yes. So maybe maybe it's coming back a bit. Um, and maybe there was some fatigue and whatever coming back from the from the from the busy summer or whatever. I don't know. So that was good to see. And maybe hopefully it's starting to come back. But yeah, he's got to he's got to score. You know, he's got to shoot better, yes, and he's got to just like find ways to score the basketball. You know, everyone's yep. got to score a little bit here and there. Yep. Um yeah, absolutely. Uh, I will take your lead. Uh, we've we've bashed we've bashed Julius Randle enough. Uh, I'll, I'll put Tibbs into detention. Uh, I really didn't get why he didn't go back quickly. Uh, yeah, more down the stretch. I and I think I wonder if he would have started quickly in one of these two in both of these games. Would they have one or maybe two more wins? Um, I'm, obviously, hindsight's always twenty twenty, and I know that they're my my biggest thought as to why he did it was he likes. I think he likes keeping the second unit strong and it gets harder to do that. If you start quickly to say nothing of the fact that like 
it's it's a it's but another well that's the thing is it's for RJ so it's not another mouth to feed because you're essentially replacing RJ's mouth and he and quickly doesn't need that level of usage that RJ typically gets or at least he doesn't seem to always get it when he starts alongside Brunson I should say um I don't know um but I didn't I didn't love it so yeah, yeah I, mean, I think history tells us now that Tibbs does not view Emmanuel quickly as a starter now I think that could be either because of how he feels just in terms of quick as a player and like he feels like he's a really great bench player but he, he's not quite that level to be like a starter I think part of it also is that he feels like the team functions best when Quick comes in second unit and gets things rolling, changes the tempo of the game, the stuff which he did, like, which he always does, which, yes. which he always does. He's done it for three years since he stepped yes. into the league. He's been doing this. He's coming into games and changing the whole complexion of games. So I, it, it, you know, there's always the balance of this guy's so good at what he does. What happens to that if you increase it and you and you try to extrapolate it out? Does it actually? Let, does it, does it, is there staying power there or does it, do you kind of have diminishing returns when you start to increase the playing time to, or, or, or change the well, rotation in that sense? So, and that's yeah. the balance. I, I, to be clear, I think you should have started quick. I think quick playing 22 minutes in a game where RJ Barrett's not in is crazy. It didn't make any sense. Josh Hart's not playing well anyway. So like none of that made a lot of sense to me. I just think this has been a tips thing for three years. Three plus yeah. now, where he just he has he's had many an opportunity to start Emmanuel quickly, and he's chosen other guys. <laughs> he's chosen other guys instead. Uh, I think it's a combination of who he thinks Quick is as a player and kind of the way he likes the team to operate. Yeah, uh, twenty two minutes is too few. And and yep, that, that I mean, there's just I, I there's nothing there's nothing else to say. Um, the way Divincenzo's playing, the way Hart's playing, like quickly, just better than those guys right now. So just playing more. Yeah, the thing about the minutes, like. I I always go back and look when he was when he played with the starters last year. He averaged in 21 games with the, as a starter, averaged almost 39 minutes a night, which is an insane number. And I understand that there were some like there was the double overtime game against Boston. There was the That's a good point. Yeah, you know there was the game against Dallas where uh, I, he played like Deuce played 45 minutes I think in that game. That game went to overtime. Like there are some there are some games that make that number go even higher, but still it's 38.6 minutes in 21 games as a starter. He can do it. And like when have you ever seen quickly I mean I guess a few times you've seen him maybe in the sh- fourth quarter like okay he's running out of gas. But even then for me it's like okay maybe He's he's pushing the creation envelope too far in games where it's like, all right, it's time to move away from quick in the fourth quarter. And then there are other times where you're like, no, keep keep bringing it quick. He's the guy that has it right now. So yeah, and he, Tibbs goes in detention. Um, no, but I mean it's a, it's a good counter, and like you know that twenty one is more it's, it's more than I remembered. Although I know that was a big part of the six man of the year debate is how many games he did start, and yeah, yeah he did start him plenty, and he played really well when he started. I think we agree. Ultimately, 22 is way too few. She needs to play more minutes, especially if RJ is not there. But even generally, he needs to play more than 22 minutes a night. Yeah. Um, okay. But uh, last thing before we get the predictions, and a uh, bad job by me. I 90, 60 seconds, not even the defense. They're the third ranked defense in the league right now. Um, how sustainable do you think it is like what what's your biggest reason for hope what's your biggest reason for negativity any anywhere you want to go with it. i just I, I just want to know what you think um i think it's sustainable okay um i think what i really like is we talked about Mitch already that's been kind of the anchor i think what jalen brunson's done defensively this year so far has kind of gone under the radar you you've mentioned that yeah he's just been a lot better both in terms of like just pursuing point of attack, getting through screens, not relying on Brunsoning people and like flopping and trying to get foul calls, like actually trying to get through screens. And his help defense has just been fantastic. Obviously, he took all those charges against um, Cleveland in the second game, yeah. which was crazy. Mm-hmm. He's just always walling up correctly. He caused Giannis travel late in the game because he's just walling up and Giannis was scared of the charge. Just really precise on on rotations. Uh, and, and like maximizing what is a very limited skill set on the defensive end. Um, so I think when you have that, so now we're talking, we know Grimes is really good out there. Uh, we know Mitch is really good out there. And it, and RJ, I think, has been better when he's been in as well. That's so now, we're, now we're, we're starting to kind of put together like really good defensive personnel. And then the bench, we know, like quick, hard, excellent defenders. Yeah. Divincenzo, 
a risk taker, a different kind of defender, but an effective one. Like he does, does cause a lot of turnovers. He, 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 he takes interesting angles and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But like, I think a good healthy dose of his kind of risk taking is, is healthy for this defense. Yeah. Um, Hartenstein's a, been a beast from day one. Like last year, it took him a while to get up to speed. I think health wise, he's come in, he's protecting the rim at, at a great rate. He's been great. So like, there's a lot of good defensive players on this roster all of a sudden. Julius is the guy that's kind of in and out. I thought against Milwaukee, he held his ground against Giannis more times than not, did his job for the most part. I know that last possession where he kind of walked around the court, got a lot of play. Like overall, I think he's been okay on the defensive end, uh, and and that's all they really need from him. They got rid of Obi, I think is okay defensively and like was better than than advertised on that end, but was not a strong defender. So you replaced him with a more of a wing type player so i think it all kind of makes sense and checks out i haven't looked i'm trying to look now at kind of what their defensive field goal percentage from three is because i know that so kind of middle of the road right yeah it was they were getting they were the luckiest team in the league with opponents threes through i think four games and now they're dead dead middle they're 50 yeah so So you know that's that's kind of the number you always look at i just took a look at it it's right right they're exactly 15th team's shooting 35.7 percent I don't see any reason why if guys continue to just kind of pull their weight on that end, including Brunson, including the best offense players on the team. Those are the guys that have been the issues in the past. And Mitch stays engaged on this level. Healthy. I think so. Uh, And health and health always like I, and the the beautiful thing about it though, uh, not Mitch as much. Mitch is invaluable, but if a guy goes down on the perimeter, you're bringing in Deuce McBride as the ninth, as the ninth. He's not going to hurt you defensively either. No, that's a comfort. Um, so there's depth on the defensive end. Sims can come in and do a lot of good things too if a big gets hurt. So, uh, yeah, I think it is sustainable. And one of my predictions coming into the year that I felt really good about was that the defense was going to jump and the offense was going to regress. Now, <laughs> now the offense can't regress like this. Well, um, we we got to get we got to get to average. But I thought the defense was going to take a jump this year. I I think if you, I think the the most like I, the the conversations about ah eh, they you know they were in this game and they were in that game and like they almost beat Boston and like you know it's a, like to me the I'm more in terms of looking for reasons for optimism. I'm more in terms of like concrete like what you just said like okay is a top five or sixty or seven even defense possible. Yes. Yes. Do we think that they will get at least back to league average offense throughout the rest of the year? I think so. I, 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 I maybe again, maybe famous last words. I think that that's possible. And if you combine a league average one thing with even a top 10 other thing, like you're that's there's your, there's your playoff team, right? So totally, you know, and, and I, I've, said it in a lot of different ways like just just get in the top six you know i, I don't i didn't never cared about four or five six, whatever get in the top six yeah and go from there T- i mean tips uh, keep saying it's tips sorry tips tips keep saying yeah. you can win without shooting well it's been he's been saying that over and over again well, you don't, have to sh- don't mess up the quote you don't have to shoot well to play well thank you That's here's the, the thing quote. here's the thing that I, my response to tips is they have been playing well other than shooting, they've yeah. been doing pretty much everything well. The turnovers are not are are, are not high. Uh, other than that terrible again New Orleans game, they've been a really good taking care of the ball. One of the best rebounding teams in the league. One of the best defensive teams in the league. They just they're not just not shooting well. They're shooting as if as if they're see they're, they're like the rim has shrunk in half. That's how they're shooting. Like you can't win. No, no. I, I I'm gonna I'm gonna disagree. You can win if you don't, you can play well, but you can't win. You can't win if you're going to shoot like this. You can't. No, you're not going to win enough games. There are three components to this team. And if you want to add a fourth component with RJ as his own entity, that's fine. The three I was going to say are Brunson's performance, Randall's performance, the three point shooting performance. In their losses, so Boston, not just bad, like, unfathomably bad Brunson and Randall. Three-point shooting was good. Two out of three, loss. Pelicans game, unfathomably bad. Three-point shooting and Randall, loss. The most recent Cavs game, unfathomably bad. Three-point shooting 
and Randall loss. And then in this last game, uh, unfathomably bad Randall, the three point shooting was 25%, which is like for a normal team, unfathomably bad. But the Knicks, it's not even like they're one of their two worst performances. But it was, but it was, it was bad enough. Um, and then I think, you know, but, and then here's where we come back to it. That's why I said you could put RJ's there as well. If RJ plays that game, I think they win the game. You know, like if you yeah. had that extra guy there, I think you can make that. Argument. And the reason that you have that formula though, that you just laid out is because you can almost take for granted the fact they're going to dominate on the boards and they're going to play good defense. Yes. Well, if you can pencil those two things in, man, you're in good shape, but uh, look, the shooting at some point and Randall at some point is just going to have to get to somewhere normal. This team as and then it'll be the team that we expect to win high forties. Yeah. Like the formula is right there for him, and it's not even like there's there's only one thing that's gone haywire, and it's the well, shooting, the, and it's the, with Randall. Yeah, yeah that was about like to say Randall <laughs> and like the shooting, but like Randall's a big part of the shooting. But so like is, yeah. so, just it, it's not this isn't that complicated in terms of analysis. It's like no. they need to shoot better and keep doing the things that they're doing on the other on the other side of the ball, and and in terms of rebounding the basketball keeping the turnovers down to doing all that, which is why I said at the, at the outset, a lot to be encouraged about the two, four, two and four start. They just need to normalize this insanity of a start of being one of the worst starts in NBA history in terms of like your best player, your second best player. You can't, can't be one of the worst players in history. He well, needs to just speak, be like a good player, you know, <laughs> or a decent player, not, a, not the worst player in, in NBA history. Speaking of two and four predictions time this is a big week. Mm. Four games. Ooh. Um, where so we are I notice here we have the Monday game. Uh I may need to have Andrew up here for a second. So we are we we're doing predictions for four games? Yes. The next pod that you and Jeremy record is next Tuesday. Oh, okay. This is good. Yes. Um well I like that we're doing all four. Um it's Clippers home on Monday, Spurs home Wednesday, Man. uh then three days off. Hornets home. It's a Sunday matinee, noontime. And then the very next day at Boston, uh, 7.30 p.m., the Spurs game is an ESPN game, uh, Boston games, NBA TV game. They need to figure out a way. This is not my prediction. I'll get to my prediction in a second. They need to figure out a way to go 2-2 two two this week. Um, I'm not saying that they would not benefit from going 3-1. and Of course they would. I think one in three would be bad. Um, <laughs> only the top, the best of analysis here. <laughs> <in this post. laughs> um, you know, because I mean, that's so that's three and seven. Can can you come back from three? Yeah, you can come back from three and seven. Of course, you can come back from three and seven. But in the back of my mind, when I looked at the, I bet as I'm sure people want to mute me or I guess you don't have to mute me you just not listen to the pod I've been saying it on every time I get in front of this microphone since before the year started I'm, I'm like go five and five in the first 10 find a way to get the five and five in the first 10 that's been my 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 talking point since the schedule came out and yet when the first when the schedule first came out in the back of my mind I'm like man if they went four and six that wouldn't be the end of the world you know and I'm I'm gonna and I still believe that Go two and two. I, I like. I, I honestly, if the two wins come against the Spurs and the, and the Hornets at home, I whatever. You you c- cannot fall four games under five hundred. At no point last year, with all the dysfunction and disaster that that um, that defined this team to the first third of the season, they never got to four games under five hundred. They were three games under five hundred once, and it was for about twenty four hours between the. Um, first Dallas game and then the Cavs game that started the eight game winning streak. So, yeah. so last season you, you, we could talk all about how they overcame adversity and they stayed, you know, through thick and thin and the whole thing. They never really dug themselves a hole early on. They found ways to get wins, even if the wins were really not that impressive, you know, you know, whether it was a win over a Timberwolves team that was perhaps the only team in the league that couldn't get out of its way, you know, more than the Knicks at that time. I remember that game. Um, and there were some other ones in there that were like, man, whatever it takes. Okay. All that being said, um, I tell you, it's funny enough. I, I want, I really do want to say three and one. And I don't know if I have the gumption. So I'll play it down the middle. I'll go, I'll go two and two. Three and one. 
<laughs> I love you. <laughs> well, I was looking about like one and three. God help me. Um, that Charlotte 12 o'clock start scares the hell out of me. That has funky, weird, like sluggish first half written all over it. Yeah. Yes. Like, I wish that game was on a Tuesday night at 7.30. Yes. So, I, I concur. <laughs> I mean, um, just please come out in that game. And look, Charlotte's been, Charlotte's looked very feisty. <laughs> they have a lot of good basketball players on that team. Um, They're no joke. I, I have yeah, their, and, their game on. If I don't know, the whole time we've been recording, they've have, have kept the Mavs at bay in Dallas throughout this game. And look, and Wemby is a freaking Martian. So no easy games on that schedule. Not one. <laughs> That Spurs game to me is a, I don't want to call it a real test, but like, so I watch most, uh, I said, I watched most of the Spurs game uh, today. Again, they were up by 22 on Toronto. They had a 15 point lead going into the fourth quarter. To say that they were in control of that game is an understatement. They were flying all over the court. They were, in, you know, getting out transition, the whole thing. And then once the tides start to, started to turn, they, it was a 180 and they're like, oh, you you watch them and like, oh, this is the youngest team in the NBA. None of these guys have been there before in these sorts of situations yeah, yeah, where it's like, yeah, we yeah. need to bring it home. Like, for that Spurs game, all due respect to Wembenyama, and like, I don't even think Kelton Johnson's playing for them right now. He's not. He was, it wasn't in the game. I don't know if he's going to be back by two, by Wednesday. We'll see. What do you mean? Not Kelton Johnson. Um, Vassell. Vassell. Sorry. Oh, um, oh, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Vassell. He's been out for a, a little while. I, I, I don't know his health. Situation, but I is uh, is RJ expected back? Clippers is that like RJ is expected back? Clippers. Okay, you said good. that. Okay, at the top. that was my bad. Good. Um, but like that Spurs game, don't give them life. Like, don't let them go out to and stake a fifteen point lead. Not that that would be the end of the game, but like, go out there and do and and again. But that's not enough because we've seen them come back. They came back on the freaking Kevin Durant and the, Sp- the Suns. So like, go out there, but but like, put your foot down. And be the, like you're still. I all due respect to Wimbledon, you're the better team by far than this first team. You're on your home court. Go do what yep. you have to do. By the way, they played the, the, the Knicks haven't won a lot of games against the Clippers, but they've always played the Clippers well since in the Tibbs era. Like they've been good games. Now it's a winnable game. Harden's starting for the first time. It's going to be a bit of an adjustment for everybody on that squad. Yeah, the, it's a very winnable game. Here's my question for you. All of these are winnable games. How do you how do you lock game? How do you lock well, Boston? Yeah, it's winnable, but Boston, frankly, looks like a killer. So they are. Yes. Here's my question. Nets gave him a good run. Here's my question. Coming out Monday night, how do you match up? This is a fascinating question to me. Why are you asking me the question that I should be asking you? Um, so defensively is one of the weirdest matchups I can remember. So I think who made the point? Um, I, I think I think it, it, it was either Zach or someone that it was a guest on Zach Lowe's podcast, and I'm out of beer, so I can't even take a drink. I take a drink of water. That like, yeah, the the it's going to be funky with those four guys, but like you're putting four, you're putting four fucking matchup issues. Even Russ at this stage of his career is still like he he, he causes headaches on the floor together, and you're going to have to force teams to be like to match up. Um. I think by default you have to put Brunson on Russ, which I, is, you know, it's tough. But like, what do you do? Agreed. And you hope that Russ tries to take over the game with that matchup. Yes, I agree. Yeah, of course. You you, you bait him into it. Um, I think you challenge Julius with the Kawhi yep. matchup. Agreed. Uh, you, Mitch. You know, obviously he's going down low. And then there's the toss up. It's like, do you do you want to put you want to go size on size with RJ and Paul George or uh, don't know if I love, but I don't know. It's, uh, is it a, is it an RJ question or is it a Grimes question? Like, where do I want to deploy? Where do I feel better about Grimes? I'm getting the most out of Grimes or is it like, where do I feel most comfortable? And and I, I, I don't want to disparage RJ. Like you said, RJ has been pretty good defensively. And he has more size than Grimes, which matters it, it, with both of these guys. I don't know. Uh, I'd probably go. I'd probably go Grimes on Harden. But agreed. We're, we're yeah. on the same page. I, I think I always, I always prefer Grimes. As many pick and rolls as I can put him in, point of attack. I think it's his best strength. 
Okay. Um, I think when he gives up size, he's okay. Uh, I don't think I don't think he's exceptional at guarding a wing who's got more size than him. I think he's okay. I think RJ's to his credit, one of the things I think he does best is isolation defense against guys like that. So, and I think he struggles more when he's in pick and roll trying to navigate screens and or kind of closing out, moving around. Like just yeah. stationary ISO, I think RJ is pretty good. So I like that PG matchup more. Of course, you're going to switch a bunch. Yeah. Um, yeah. One through four, basically, other than Brunson. Brunson won't switch, um, but everyone else will switch. So you're gonna, they're all going to end up with t- uh, on all these guys. But I, I, that's how I like to line up as well. I think that's the, that's the way to go. It's going to be a fascinating watch from both well, teams' perspectives. <laughs> it's going to be And the other part of it is like, if they are going to start these three guys, it kind of turns Paul George into like the, the most uh, decorated floor spacer in, in league history. Yeah. Because uh, like it's how many weird. It's going to be so strange. But like, I wonder like they'll RJ, stagger heavily though. Like they'll pull someone yeah. real early and they'll, they'll, well, know. no man though. No man. Um, for this game, he's out, which like their bench is still good. Like they still have Norm Powell. Like they, they, uh, um, that PJ Tucker, I'll be curious to see how you use PJ Tucker in this game. A lot um, of talent on that team, man. Sheesh. That's, I, I understand why they made the bet. I would have made the bet if that's, if the cost was the cost, I, I would have made mean, the bet too. That, that team would have been really good in like 2017. Like they're gonna be good now, but like you're know, like <laughs> would have been really good in twenty. All right, well, Harden, Westbrook, and Kawhi—that was the MVP race that year. They year were that? the they were the it top was three. Was a, yeah, they were the top three. There was a fourth guy who was discussed. I'm assuming it was LeBron, but I don't remember actually. That's bonkers. good assumption. Yeah, yeah, that is um, really bonkers. I know we're running a little bit long, but like I I wrote something in for tomorrow's newsletter where I was I. I Offhandedly, I wrote like me, referred to the Clippers four stars as like the the Clippers four future Hall of Famers. I have Paul George in, and I I actually don't I don't think it's particularly close. Not, not maybe not first ballot or whatever the NBA equipment. Like again, the NBA voting process is shenanigans. But like, you think Paul George is a Hall of Famer? Andrew's yeah, name. I do. I'm not very good at like what the cutoff is generally, and like, but that's the thing. Is it like the he screams no... Hall of Famer to me? Like he's exceptional. He played basketball. <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> that's the cutoff. There you go. Look, the, uh, a healthy career of Paul George would be really interesting. He's missed a lot of time um, with some really crappy injuries, but guy is so so good. Um, and those early Indiana runs, like when he was first emerging were really fun and he was a beast. So, you know, uh, I, think, I think so. Eight time all star, six time all NBA, four time all defense, uh, topped out at third and MVP voting. That's it's going to get him in. That's why like he's, he's, he's going to get in. I just was curious if, if it passed the smell test for you, it, it does for me. So yeah, yeah. Yep, gold medalist does. too. So he's got the Olympic side of it that, they consider when they when you do that. By the way, I will give either of you an imaginary hundred dollar bill if you can name who finished fifth in that MVP race in 2017. In 2017? So it's Russ one, Harden two, Kawhi three, LeBron four, and then name the fifth. We'll go back and forth. John, you first. Name a name. Uh Blake Griffin. No. Benji. 2017. <laughs> I hope this is good radio. I think it's it's good that you're guessing. Mm. Name and name. Steph? It's finished six. No. It's Ooh. not either of the Warriors guys. This was no. the I mean, first I, KD. Yeah, I mean, I figured Durant it wasn't because it, would, yeah. it sounds like it's a random name. And I, Kevin Durant I knew, finished tied for ninth. Yeah, I knew it wasn't either of them. <laughs> Um, Marcus Saul. No, didn't finish top eleven. <clears throat> it's a crappy guess, John. I, I, I I'm throwing out. I, I'm not good. This is once a crappy. You past, <laughs> once you get past a certain number of years, okay. I'm bad with like placing. Wait, don't say it. Don't say it. Oh no. Twenty seventeen. Ah. I got nothing. Okay, so quick history. Take a guess. Oh, never Come mind. On, at least go guess. one more guess. One more guess. Lamarcus Aldridge. 
No. So quick history lesson. Mm. In 2017, uh, Kevin Durant went to the Warriors. So a, a 73 win team got better. And in the Eastern Conference, um, a team won 52 games and got the one seed. It was the Boston oh, Isaiah Celtics Thomas. and Isaiah Thomas oh, who finished fifth in MVP that year. Deserved, by the way. And made an all-NBA first team. <laughs> wild. One of the wildest That's seasons. A- I think he That's made a second team. He made second team that year because Russ and uh, Russ Harden. and Harden made one and two. But yeah, Isaiah Thomas, top five NBP finish. He's available to play, by the way. If any team he is. It. He's he, he lets it be known. Exactly. Next, I need some shooting. He thought the he thought the Brinks truck was was coming after that uh, balloting got done. But uh, oh, thanks, last. Danny Ainge. <laughs> uh, that's a bad job. I mean, I should remember that. Okay, uh, some announcements. Uh, we will have watch along. So again, for anybody who's, uh, you know, has, has been on the uptick here, uh, we, you can tune into the Knicks film school, YouTube channel, Sub- subscribe first of all to that channel and watch us watch basketball games, which is as fun as it sounds. Uh, you could do this on uh, November 6th, 8th and 13th. So that is going to be, uh, Tonight, as you're listening to this podcast against the Clippers, that that'll be fun. That'll be that'll be wild. And then the Wemby game, and then um, Sunday uh, against the oh, sorry, no Monday against Boston. No Sunday. Should note um, it's these two gentlemen as well as DJ Zulo tonight on Monday. So you get John and the X's and O's guys on the Monday night watch along. That's gonna be. I'm. I am going to be. You guys have three X's and O's guys. Excuse right. me. It's three X's and O's guys. I, no, John I, doesn't go on KFS X's and O's. No, I'm, okay, not, I'm just those guys. <laughs> I'm just going to be listening to you to teach me about what I'm watching. It's going to be great for me. Um, Tuesday, uh, Fred Katz uh, coming coming on the the pod. To ever heard me. of him? <laughs> cats chat. He writes for um, the Athletic. Yes, cats chats. A cats chat on Z. on Tuesday. Yes. Uh, then there's pregame pods every game day, twelve hours before tip. That is usually when they drop. Andrew Claudio uh, continues to kill it with those and then crushing. absolutely crushing and com- please like this video and remember to subscribe rate and review nailed it thank you everybody is Benji, anything else <laughs> no miss you Jeremy come back soon <laughs> you feel that great thank you it's at least I get it Andrew we good very good wonderful yeah. Did the Jets oh the Jets are playing? Well, I can't wait for Monday night when New oh, York plays LA. Yes. Yes. Um I you saw a giant score that. at one point today. What do you mean? 24 nothing. What do you mean? You can, you can wait. No, I, I I'm excited for when New York plays LA on Monday night. There's both of my teams are playing LA on Monday night. Um, the Knicks and know. the Clippers. The Knicks and the Jets. Okay. Uh, we look forward to that as well. All right. Thanks, everybody, uh, for tuning in to another episode of the Next Film School podcast. Uh, we will uh, be back with more funny games before you know it. Peace out.